Hi, my name is Ken Spector with LivingEco.com, and we're here with Nick Drobeck, and Nick is with the Clean Oceans Project. Can you tell me a little bit about the project? Yeah, the Clean Oceans Project's mission is to clean up marine plastic. Have you heard of the North Pacific Gyre or the Garbage Patch? Yes. Millions of tons of plastic trapped out in the ocean, and up to this point, nobody has come up with any solutions on cleaning it up. So three years ago, my partner and I put together a project uh, specifically to identify technology that could be used to locate it, take it out of the water, and process it. And we figured out the first two uh, parts of that puzzle. The third part, the disposal part, was the big challenge for us. We didn't want to go and put it in a landfill, but we didn't know how we could repurpose all that plastic. There's millions and millions of tons of plastic out there. So when we stumbled across this technology, it was kind of a no-brainer for us because not only does it eliminate the need to go back to land once you've collected it and put it in a landfill, but it also creates fuel to put in the vessel to continue cleaning up. I've heard and I've read that most of the plastic particles out in the ocean are so small that it... Here we go. Do we... Yes. Where's the jar? Oh, here we are. So this is an example. Uh, is this the typical size of the plastics? Was this actually pulled directly out of the that ocean? Was taken out of the North Pacific Gyre. Um, so plastic goes in, obviously, in the form of bottles, uh, razors, Bic lighters, toothbrushes, clamshell to-go containers, you name it. It goes in as whole pieces of, of whatever these individual items are. Yes. But after they stay out in the ocean for long periods of time, they're exposed to solar radiation which causes them to photodegrade. That's a process where it becomes brittle and it breaks up into these pieces. Part of our location technology revolves around satellite and radar technology, and what that does is it finds the concentration areas. So if, you, if you've ever taken an oceanography class, Oceanography 101 will tell you that the environment organizes that material in what are called windrows or Ekman lines. So the idea, instead of trying to cover the many millions of square miles that are affected, you find the areas where it's more densely populated 20, 30, 50 times as much on these rows as it would be anywhere else in the ocean. Right. So you just go and cherry pick right along the line where it congregates. So can, now here's a machine. This is the, uh, this is the Blessed Company Limited machine. And what I've heard and what I've seen is this can convert plastics of a variety of types into different types of oil. Right. Yes. Now, my question is regarding this plastic. This is so small. Is it able to convert this? Could we pour this into the machine and could it convert this right into plastic? It wouldn't make much, but yes. You, yes. Can, you, can, take, you can take numbers uh, one, two, four, five, and six. Sorry. I forget. I, I get all the numbers mixed up occasionally. Uh, high density and low density polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene. That makes up about 90% of the plastic waste stream any of those materials can be put into this machine and converted. That makes uh, the pl uh, most of the plastic waste stream, does that make up the most of the plastic waste stream in the oceans? Well, the beauty of it is the two kinds of plastic that it doesn't work well on don't float. Uh -huh. So we won't find that out there. Okay. So basically anything in this jar could be converted into its constituent, into oil. Correct. And the reason it's not floating in here is that's alcohol to prevent it from getting uh, mossy and, and yuck. That's why this isn't floating. If you put those particles into a glass of water, they would float. Why is all this plastic ending up in the oceans? Because we're sloppy. Because uh, people everywhere, first of all, we, we sort of live in a bubble here in the United States, and especially here on the coast. Recycling is a big deal here. You go 100 miles inland, it's not as big a deal there. They don't have the infrastructure in most third world countries to handle their primary waste stream, much less do recycling. So a lot of it comes from third world countries. It's not to disparage third world countries, they just haven't gotten to the point where they can focus on waste stream like we do. 80% yes. uh, of the material in the ocean is land-based, meaning it gets thrown out of the window of a car, blows out of a garbage truck, winds up in a watershed, then in a storm drain, in a river, and it ends up in the sea. The other 20% comes from shipping activities, oil uh, platforms, you name it. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take a look at this blessed machine. How does this work exactly? So, as I mentioned, this is a demonstration model for educational purposes. An actual commercial unit would look very different from this, but this is a single batch unit, whereas a commercial unit would have an auger feed, and so it would be a constant feed of plastic and a constant output of fuel. This does it in two pound batches. So, two pounds of plastic goes in there. A liter of fuel comes in here. 
there's a two-stage chamber, heating chamber, no oxygen at all. There's no combustion, no incineration, no smoke. That's really important for people to understand because when you tell people you're going to convert plastic into fuel, they think, ah, the environmental degradation, the, the fumes, the emissions are going to be awful. There's no combustion happening in here. Heats it up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It liquefies the plastic, then it vaporizes it, comes through this tube here, and it gets reconstituted in this water. Okay. Now, in a commercial system, there would not be a water chamber. This is just so people can see what's happening and why it works. In a commercial unit, there's a chilling uh, chamber, coils, and, and a cooling chamber to reconstitute it into a liquid. Do you know about the price, not of this unit, but the, uh, the approximate price of the commercial units? Yeah, well, they range, in, they range in size based on the input. So a unit that takes a 275 pounds in a 24-hour period is about $125,000 to $150,000. The biggest unit takes uh, 2,700 pounds in a 24-hour period, and I believe that one's about $700,000. So what is some of the resistance from, let's say, recycling facilities that recycle plastic of putting one of these units into the recycling facility to convert plastic to oil on the fly. There's no resistance at all. This technology has only been available in the state since April. Okay. So it's just a matter of us getting out there and putting the information in the right hands. The arguments that I have heard is that a lot of the plastic is so small in the ocean that a machine like this might not be able to work on. But you're saying it would indeed work on tiny particles of plastic to convert them over into Size oil. Of particles doesn't really matter. In fact, what you would do in a commercial system is if you had a bottle or a, a container of some sort made out of plastic, you put it sh through a shredder to make it small. You want the pieces to be small because the, the auger that feeds it into the heating chamber needs the pieces to be small to digest. Yes. So the size, the relative size of the particles is totally irrelevant. If it's petroleum based and it's not a PVC or a nylon, it goes right in. How much plastic is out in the ocean? I've heard two times the size of Texas. I've heard it's much smaller. I've heard it's much larger. Well, do, do you know any information that perhaps I don't? It's Because it's such a dynamic environment, it's really difficult to say there's X amount of pounds in there. The United Nations and a couple of other research institutes have decided that it's somewhere between 5 and 10 million tons just in the North Pacific. But it's important also to keep in mind that there are five major gyres in the world. North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North and South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. They all contain roughly the same amount of plastic. Now, the one thing that the media has sort of done to confuse people is they've called it an island. There is no island. There's no carpet of plastic. There's no mass. You couldn't fly over it and look at it in a plane. It's more like a soup. So there's pieces that size all the way up to intact pieces floating around, dispersed all over the northern Pacific Ocean. But there are certain areas that plastic congregates in, convergent zones, that are the function of currents and wind pushing the material into organized piles. Yep. So the objective for us is to figure out where those organized piles are and then just cherry pick up and down those lines. So do you foresee a solar powered vessel going out into the ocean with a large Blessed Technologies machine, exactly cleaning up the oceans and coming back on with barges of oil? That's exactly what we're working on. The collection vessel that we're designing is a catamaran, a two-hold vessel for a variety of reasons. It's a much more stable platform to work on. It can be powered by wind. We are working with a solar company out of Massachusetts called Konarka, and they are creating solar panels that will power the blessed system on board our vessel. So we'll actually be using ex very little fuel to begin with, but what little we do need will come right out of the machine. And then you could actually, yeah, you could propel the vessel back to shore with the fuel that you've created. Right. And you don't have to go back to land to dump the plastic that you collected yes. into a landfill. What, how many gallons of oil make you know that the blessed technology could convert from plastic would you estimate are in the ocean right now what is the value of that plastic in current dollars if you figure you get about a gallon of fuel out of eight pounds of plastic it's a hard math calculation to do in my head but let's say out of 10 pounds you get a gallon um, i think the last time we calculated it was somewhere on the order of two billion gallons four bucks a gallon retail that's easy math. This is not intended to supplant any sort of uh, existing fuel sources. This is merely a way to repurpose what's currently being considered a waste product, creating value out of that waste product. Mm -hmm. What is the residue of this process? Great question. So, as I said, oxygen-free environment, no combustion, 
there is a little bit of CO2. The smallest commercial unit generates about as much CO2 as two people breathing in a 24-hour period. There's also a little bit of water vapor. And at the end of the month, there's a, a char uh, receptacle in the bottom that needs to be cleaned. But if you're operating this thing at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you would generate about a cup full of char at the end of a month. And, that, and that's carbon, it's an inert uh, substance, can be put, not dangerous at all, can be put into your compost pit, can be put into road bed, it can be put into a landfill, but again, you're reducing the volume of it so dramatically, and it's inert. It seems like Bless Technologies is onto something huge in terms of being able to convert a waste stream into something that's literally liquid gold. I mean, it's, 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 it's very valuable in this country and around the world. We still have to stop polluting our waters with plastic, though. Absolutely. This is not an excuse no. to continue to pollute the oceans. No, and, and that's one of the biggest messages that we try to get out to people. We are but one solution, one possible solution to the overall problem. It's not a silver bullet. No matter how successful we are at cleaning it up, and processing it into fuel, if people don't change their habits on land, the problem's gonna persist because we can never take out as much as we're currently putting in. So what we try and encourage people to do is first and foremost, refuse. And it's not, we're not against all plastic because there are certain things that have to be made out of plastic. Computer cases, automobile parts, medical equipment. We're not anti-plastic. What we're anti is the single-use plastic, the water bottles, the coffee cup lids, the stir sticks, the drinking straws. The stuff that was made to last you about three or four minutes to use will live in the environment for 50 to 100 years. That's what we want to get rid of. What problems is this causing in our oceans? Where to begin? So let's start with the big and work to the small. One of the biggest problems in the ocean right now are ghost nets, and ghost nets are nothing more than derelict fishing gear, all made out of HDPE and LDPE. So when you get a commercial vessel that's using a long line or a big drift net, when those break free from a boat, nobody bothers to go back and pick them up because it's too time consuming to untangle them and bring them back on board and, and get them fishing again. So they just abandon them. They continue to fish, they continue to kill things, and then over time they wrap up in a ball, like a hairball. Those hairballs of net end up being a navigational hazard for vessels. They get stuck in a propeller and you can disable a large ocean-going freighter to the point where somebody's got to go out and pick it up and drag it back in. When those net balls get in close to shore, they act like a battering ram in uh, nearshore environments. Reef systems are, are the biggest victims of this you get a little bit of tidal surge behind a net ball and it can bulldoze a reef instantly. Once it hits dry land, it opens up like a carpet and it kills everything else underneath it. So that's number one. Number two is the entanglement issue. If you look in our pamphlet, we've got an awful picture of a sea lion that's been caught in a fishing net. We've got plenty of pictures of, of birds that have ingested plastic and died because it, it takes up all the room in their stomach and they can't take nutrition in. But probably the biggest thing and the thing that we should most be concerned about as humans is that the plastic particles have this way of absorbing ambient chemicals out of the ocean water. And when fish mistake those particles of plastic for food, they ingest them and they absorb the chemicals into their flesh. And pretty soon it works its way up the food chain into your halibut, your swordfish, your tuna, and then you're eating the same chemicals that were all over that plastic. Have you seen any studies on our fish supply as far as I'm just curious how many fish uh, how, uh, populations have been studied for the amount of chemicals or plastics that they have ingested and are in their systems. You know, I know that those statistics are out there. I would not be the one to quote them because I'm sure I'll get them wrong. But I do know that the Five Gyres Institute and Algalita Marine Research Foundation have done surface tows and they have fished uh, on some of these trips and they have taken samples cut open bellies of fish and found plastic particles. In fact, I'll show you. Take a look here. So this fish is what's called a rainbow runner. Okay. And this fish was actually caught by Marcus Erickson, Dr. Marcus Erickson of the Five Gyres Institute. He had actually intended to eat this fish for dinner while they were on one of their voyages. Mm -hmm. And during the preparation of that fish for dinner, they found 17 pieces of plastic in the gut. So all of those pieces are exactly the same size as that. That fish is probably a foot, foot and a half. And any of those pieces of plastic were probably laden with all the chemicals that I was just describing. And that's the picture of the sea line right there. Wow. 
the Clean Oceans Project, what do you need to see the, a greater success or the uh, proliferation of your message from the Clean Oceans Project? Obviously money and donations, but what else do you need to see for your message to get out there to the masses? Partnerships. What, what type of partnerships are you looking for? We're working with any organization that has a, has a similar goal in mind to clean the oceans and prevent plastic from getting in there in the first place. Um, we're talking to a lot of different companies who are interested. Nobody's actually stepped up and written a check yet. But with the addition of this new technology, I have a feeling that that's going to change. What is their resistance? Why are they not stepping up to plate? Well, a variety of things. First of all, out of sight, out of mind. If you live more than 50 miles away from the coast, you don't spend much time on the beach. You don't see a lot of plastic. If you live in the middle of the country, you figure, eh, you know, I've got my own problems. Well, the problem is if you eat fish, and most Americans eat fish at some point in their diet, they're ingesting fish that potentially have these chemicals in them. So out of sight, out of mind, big problem. Until now, there hasn't really been a viable solution, and we're doing our best to get the word out there and let people know that there is a solution. This is basically a problem that is has been uh, occurring for as many years as plastic has been on the planet. They and have found plastic out in the gyre dating from World War II. Mm. Wow. How long does it take for this plastic to break down into what something that's probably more deadly, which is microparticles of plastic? Is that what it ends up as? So it never, it, when I said the term photodegrade, that's the process that plastic goes through to be become smaller and smaller particles until it becomes a dust and then it settles to the bottom as it as it bioaccumulates as you get you know that sea slime on that is on everything in the ocean it becomes ne negatively buoyant and sinks to the bottom so over time it will end up carpeting the bottom of our of our seafloor and what problems does that cause well aside from the fact that we shouldn't be dumping in the ocean in the first place uh, there are lots of animals that survive on the bottom of the ocean yes has the impact been studied as far as what these plastic particles do once they sink to the bottom of the ocean? Again, I'm sure that that study has been done, but I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the statistics to tell you. Okay. Well, fantastic work that you're doing. So what would you say is your pitch in terms of, you know, let's just say you had the, uh, you had the audience of all 7 billion people on the planet. What would you tell those 7 billion people in terms of what they can do to help our oceans? What I would tell them to do first is refuse the single-use plastics. What I would tell them next is figure out a way to reuse or recycle the things that you do have to use and handle them properly. Demand that your city, that your county, that your community has a recycling project in place that doesn't just ship plastic overseas because the vast majority are recycled, are shipped overseas and burned like coal to make steam, to make electricity. And none of the emissions are captured and that's the source, one of the biggest sources of acid rain. Thank you very, very much, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you.